In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And with your spirit. Brothers and sisters, I welcome you on this 29th Sunday in Ordinary Time in which Jesus encourages us to give what is owed to God, truly to God, which is our entire lives. And today, this Mass is offered for Joseph and Mary Matlish. So, brothers and sisters, let us acknowledge our sins and prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words and what I have done and on what I have failed to do through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore I ask, Blessed Mary, ever virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life.
ever-living God, grant that we may always conform our will to yours and serve your majesty in sincerity of heart. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Thus says the Lord to his anointed Cyrus, whose right hand I grasp, subduing nations before him and making kings run in his service, opening doors before him and leaving the gates unbarred. For the sake of Jacob, my servant of Israel, my chosen one, I have called you by your name giving you a title, though you knew me not. I am the Lord, and there is no other. There is no God besides me. It is I who arm you, though you know me not, so that toward the rising and the setting of the sun, people may know that there is none besides me. I am the Lord, there is no other. The word of the Lord. A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Thessalonians. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father 
and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you, remembering you in our prayers, unceasingly calling to mind your work of faith and labor of love and endurance in hope of our Lord Jesus Christ before our God and Father, knowing, brothers and sisters loved by God, how you were chosen. For our gospel did not come to you in word alone, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with much conviction. The word of the Lord. According to Matthew, glory to you, O Lord. The Pharisees went off and plotted how they might entrap Jesus in speech. They sent their disciples to him with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are a truthful man and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. And you are not concerned with anyone's opinion, for you do not regard a person's status. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it lawful to pay the census tax to Caesar or not? Knowing their malice, Jesus said, Why are you testing me, you hypocrites? Show me the coin that pays the census tax. Then they handed him the Roman coin. He said to them, Whose image is this, and whose inscription? They replied, Caesar's. At that he said to them, Then repay to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and to God what belongs to God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Today's gospel begins with the Pharisees plotting how they might entrap Jesus. They're not concerned with the truth, but only how they can trick him. It might even remind us too of many discussions now in politics, which seems less concerned with the truth or what is actually good, but trying to trick people into saying this or that. And this is what is happening to Jesus. If he says yes, he would be accused by the Jews of being a Roman sympathizer. But if he says no, he'd be accused by the Romans of rebellion. But Jesus does not answer on the level that they bring it to him, but instead says, show me the coin. And then ask them, whose image is this and whose inscription? And so what he's pointing out to them here is it says, Tiberius Caesar, or Caesar Augustus Tiberius, son of the divine Augustus. So first of all, he's pointing out that on this coin, it's breaking the Jewish law that said that there should be no graven images, no false images. And second, that it says that he is the son of an emperor who is divine, that he is God when he is not God. So he's pointing out the lies that are there. But it also leads to a deeper thing, this question, whose image? This same word that we see at the beginning of the Bible, in Genesis 1, 26 and 27, where it says, God said, let us make human beings in our image, after our likeness. 
And so God created mankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So while the coins bear the image and likeness of Caesar, we bear the image and likeness of God. Which means that when Jesus responds, then repay to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and to God what belongs to God. But everything ultimately belongs to God. So on the one hand, yes, we need to fulfill our civil duties, and we need to fulfill the law. So that means, yes, sorry, we have to pay taxes. But on the other hand, our primary duty is to serving God. And this is a higher duty, which means that even Caesar, even our leaders, first and primarily have to answer to God and have our input, need to put God first. And so this means to the extent that the Roman emperor or our leaders today safeguard the law, then yes, we need to follow the law. However, Jesus points out the limits, that there are things that are Caesar's, but there are also things that belong to God. And whenever Caesar, whenever a political leader exalts themselves as God, then they have exceeded their limits. And obedience then would be a denial of God, and so we cannot obey, we cannot buy into those lies. This reminds me that this past Friday, October 16th, was the anniversary of the election of Pope John Paul II in 1978. And this Thursday, October 22nd, we will celebrate his feast day as a saint. But long before he was pope, when he was about to begin his sophomore year of college in Krakow, in September of 1939, Germany invaded Poland. And they didn't merely want to rule Poland, but they wanted to destroy it. And the way that they were going to do this is the same way that all totalitarians do, by controlling the cultural memory of the Polish people. They had to make them forget their history and to deny their history and to deny their Catholic religion. Well, John Paul II, then known as Karol Wojtyla, committed himself to cultural resistance, but he did this not by picking up a gun and by, with violence, but instead he and his theater friends wrote and performed underground plays on religious and historical themes in order to keep the cultural memory alive. And they performed these in secret for clandestine audiences. And had they been caught, they would have surely been sent to prison camps or even more likely been put to death. They risked their life to be able to enact these plays. And why? Because it was so important to proclaim the truth and to not buy into these false lies, especially the lie that there is no God, the lie that we are not made in the image and likeness of God and that we do not have dignity, but that someone else would give us our dignity and not God himself. And then also that the lie that our fulfillment comes only in ourself and what the, the state gives us instead of our fulfillment comes in giving and receiving love and participating in society in building a culture of love and of truth. Or as John Paul II would later say, a civilization of love and truth to counter this culture of death. And so it is so important for us today, as always is the case for humanity, to resist these lies, especially when it calls us to worship these false idols, just as Jesus points out the false idol of Caesar on the coin today. You've heard it from me many times, these four idols that St. Thomas Aquinas points out, what I call the less than fantastic four of money, power, pleasure, and popularity. You know, C.S. Lewis, who wrote the Chronicles of Narnia and other great works like The Four Loves, talks about how if we worship idols, idols are going to break our hearts because they can never give us what we truly want, which is love, because they are things Whereas God is not a thing, God is love. God is this personal love. And so in order to build up the civilization of love and truth, we need to be able to recognize God and that we're created in his image and likeness and how we fulfill that image and likeness by giving and receiving love. But when we make money an idol, then instead we become 
we see others as an enemy, those who have more than us, or we can see ourselves in this struggle where then now we become reduced to individuals who are defined by our own desires, that our fulfillment comes from mo having more and more. But then we become enslaved because then it's easier to sell us things. And so we have to recognize that we are not for sale. Our dignity does not come from by what we have or what we own. As John Paul II says, man is not made for the market, the market is made for man. So yes, to own things, to make money, but to never put that first, but to recognize our dignity comes first of being created in the image and likeness of God. Secondly, with power. And with power, we think that, well, if only I would have enough power, I would be in control of my life. And we can also think that in order to be happy in life, what we need is to the power of certain political parties comes first. But what comes first before that comes our faith in God and being made in his image and likeness. Otherwise, it's very curious to me that today we are told that there is no truth. We, as Pope Benedict had said, we can buy into this dictatorship of relativism, that there is no such thing as truth. But then the truth is only told to us by who is in power. But as St. John Paul II warned 25 years ago in Evangelium Vitae, the Gospel of Life, he writes, there is a sinister result of relativism, relativism which reigns unopposed. The right ceases to be such because it is no longer firmly founded on the inviolable dignity of the person, but is made subject to the will of the stronger part. In this way, democracy, contradicting its own principles, effectively moved towards a form of totalitarianism, of putting all the power into this, the state. And so the state no longer becomes a common home where all can live together on the basis of the principles of fundamental equality, but is then transformed into a tyrant state, which arrogates to itself the right to dispose of the life of the weakest and most defenseless members, from the unborn child to the elderly, in the name of public interest, which is really nothing but the interest of one part. And so we must resist anything, lies, that would tell us that the power is by, by this interest, but instead co power comes from self-giving love. As Jesus tells us, power comes from service, of giving of ourselves out of others. That is where our true power comes. And anyone who would contradict that or put that power over, especially our weakest members, would be false. But with pleasure, too, we can, can become an idol, especially after the sexual revolution of saying that what truly gives us dignity and value in life is how much pleasure that we can have. And if the state can give us guarantees to have pleasure, then this is what, is what gives us our dignity. But instead, to see that, no, our dignity comes first from being created in the image and likeness of God. And whenever we use people, uh, rather than loving people and using things, we are falling beneath our dignity. Whenever we put the lives of the unborn as less important than our own fulfillment, we are losing our sense of our own dignity. Because recognizing once we say that life is no longer important, then all lives lose their value. Instead, again, to see first comes our dignity as people. And then, lastly, of popularity. We all desire to be loved and to be known by others. But to see that our popularity comes not by just pushing ourselves out on others, but instead by being able to be known for who we truly are in this dignity that's given to us by God. So let us, as over this week and next Sunday, as we contemplate more, as we celebrate John Paul II on this 100th anniversary of his birth, I encourage you to take his words and his life seriously. We will be reflecting more on that this Thursday and then even next weekend as well. And so to reflect on what it means to be created in the image and likeness of God to find our dignity there, 
and then to fulfill that dignity by giving of ourselves out of love to others. That is how we will truly build a civilization of love and truth. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come filled with love for the Father and confident in his promises, we now join together to present our needs to him. For Pope Francis, that he may continue to challenge us to open our hearts and heed the message of unity marked by love and self-giving that bears the image of Jesus, we pray to the Lord. For elected and appointed officials, that God may give them favor and grace in working to protect the dignity and sanctity of human life from conception through natural death. We pray to the Lord. For those who serve in mission territories, that God will renew their spirits and give them the resources they need to guide and help those whom they serve. We pray to the Lord. For all educators, that God will sustain and comfort them as they strive to balance educational needs with the concerns of safety of students and staff, we pray to the Lord. For the ill, the hospitalized, and all those affected by COVID-19, that the Lord may, cont may contain the spread of infection and keep all under the shelter of his mercy, we pray to the Lord. For our deceased loved ones, especially Joseph and Mary Motlush, that they may know the abundance of new life in God's heavenly kingdom. We pray to the Lord. Lord hear our prayer. For all of us gathered here today, for all the prayers that we hold in the silence of our hearts, for all our intentions, spoken and unspoken, we pray to the Lord. Lord hear our Loving Father, we bring you our petitions, trusting that in your love and in your time, you will hear and answer them according to your holy will. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Have love. 
Brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Grant us, Lord, we pray, a sincere respect for your gifts, that through the purifying action of your grace we may be cleansed by the very mysteries we serve. Through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks. Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, for you laid the foundations of the world and have arranged the changing of times and seasons. You formed man in your own image and set humanity over the whole world in all its wonder to rule in your name all over all you have made and forever praise you in your mighty works through Christ our Lord. And so with all the angels we praise you as in joyful celebration we acclaim. gives you praise for through your son our Lord Jesus Christ by the power and working of the Holy Spirit you give life to all things and make them holy and you never cease to gather a people to yourself so that from the rising of the Sun to its setting a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name therefore O Lord we humbly implore you by the same spirit graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you.
In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice and giving you thanks, he said the blessing and gave the chalice to his disciples saying, take this all of you and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. We proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come, until you come again. Therefore, O Lord, we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven. And as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray, upon the oblation of your church and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you will to reconcile us to yourself. Grant that we, who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with his Holy Spirit, may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the, your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, with Saint Teresa and Saint John Paul II, and with all the saints on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth, with your servant Francis our Pope and Joseph our Bishop, the order of bishops, all the clergy and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, Gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. To our departed brothers and sisters and to all who are pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory. Through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him, O oh God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace, I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Let us offer each other the sign of peace.
Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb.
Grant, O Lord, we pray, that benefiting from participation in heavenly things, we may be helped by what you give in this present age and prepared for the gifts that are eternal. Through Christ our Lord. Please be seated. We have a few announcements. During the month of October, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday after Holy Mass at 7 p.m., we will pray the Rosary. We cordially invite you to the patronal feast of the Archdiocese and Shrine of St. John Paul II. The Solemnity of St. John Paul II will take place on Wednesday and Thursday. On Wednesday, we invite you to the Vigil Mass at 7 p.m. On a Thursday, there will be an all-day adoration of the Blessed Sacrament, ending with a Holy Mass at 7 p.m. in English. After the evening Holy Masses, both on Wednesday and a Thursday, we invite you to the St. John Paul II Hall, where there will be an exhibition of works made by our children on the occasion of the birth of John Paul II, this year, 100. John Paul II was born 100 years ago, and first celebration normally we have in May, but the COVID, that means we were not even able to come to the church. And we are so blessed because to, as a shrine, we can have more than one uh, feast celebration, that means uh, 22nd is the day when we can truly pay attention to St. John Paul II. The month of November is approaching a time of special remembrance and prayer for our dead. Holy Masses on All Souls Day and the Novena Holy Masses for the deceased after All Saints Day for a total of nine days we will celebrate for the intention of our dead. We will pray for our deceased parents, relatives, friends, co-workers, and benefactors whose name will be written on their remembrance envelopes. Please place the envelopes in the basket during the collection or stop by or send them to the parish office before November 1st. Additional envelopes are provided at the entrance to the church. We would like to express our deep gratitude to all volunteers for their time, commitment, and talents in our new parish project, Sunday's Lunches. We would like to thank everyone who came last week, last Sunday, and bought our food. The total income for the parish was $1,000. Today, we would like to invite everyone to a charity yard sale maybe you already saw outside, all the collection, collected funds will be donated to help Nikos, who is suffering from SMA, spinal muscular atrophy. He's even not a year and a half old, and uh, it is one of the most expensive medical support for him. And... Nikos lives in Poland. He has many, her, his parents have many friends. And they simply approached me a few weeks ago, Father, if we can do something to support our friends because they are in such a great need. I will truly appreciate if you find something for yourself and support this and entire fund will go to support Nikos and his parents in that tremendous battle. After final blessing, we need volunteers to help us to disinfect pews in our church. Please come to the sacristy after final blessing. Once again, I thank you and have a blessed and peaceful weekend. Let us pray for the intercession of St. Michael, the Archangel. St. Michael, the Archangel, defend us in battle. We are against the wickedness and snares of the dead. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, us and tell us, Satan, and all the evil spirits who prowl throughout the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. 
The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life. Thanks be to God. How can I keep 